Back in the first century, I doubt if any guy did woodworking for a hobby. It was hard work, really hard work, and a carpenter with his tools was a man of true skill. I'm Gregory Seltz, speaker of the Lutheran Hour. In this Men's Network Bible Study, we're going to look at one of these guys. His name was Joseph, and he was a carpenter of steel. He was also the foster father, the protector of an exceptional child who would change human history. Joseph probably lived, worked, and died, never realizing that we'd be talking about him today. He had a small business that was plagued by many interruptions, and he might have thought his greatest legacy would be the bench he might have made for the local synagogue. But the thing I like most about Joseph is how determined he was to get the job done, whatever that might be. Dr. Paul Meyer, one of our favorite experts, tells us more. Carpenters in those days would come probably in the middle class status. Uh, they were, of course, in much demand. But again, Joseph might have been more than just a carpenter. Let me explain. Uh, in those days, there was not that much wood in Palestine. Everything is stone over there. And Joseph is called a tecton, which can translate also anybody in the construction trades. And so Joseph could also have been a stone cutter in addition to being a carpenter. Uh, could have been a mason in terms of a building with brick and this kind of thing. So uh, actually he was very skilled in anything that required building up. And so as a carpenter, of course, it would have been roofs for the stone houses. It would have been boat hulls, benches, chairs, tables, furniture, this kind of thing. We first meet Joseph in the first chapter of Matthew. Unlike the famous Christmas story in Luke, Matthew was very matter-of-fact in describing the birth of Christ. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together. From the moment they were betrothed or legally pledged to be married, Mary and Joseph were considered husband and wife. But even though they were husband and wife, they were not to come together, you know, become sexually active until after the wedding. Virginity was expected throughout the betrothal period, which usually lasted nine to 12 months, long enough to make sure that there wasn't any child on the way when they came together. We don't know exactly how old Joseph was when he was betrothed to Mary, but girls back then got married pretty young. In those days, girls married shortly after puberty, whereas uh, the husbands would have to wait until they had accumulated something of a nest egg for the future household. Uh, Mary, whether she was about 15 or so, is indeterminate, but in any case, the marriage was probably arranged because in the ancient world, in fact, even in the medieval world, marriages mainly were arranged by the parents. It was during this betrothal period that Joseph made a startling discovery. Matthew tells us about it. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. This wouldn't be the first time a guy discovered his girlfriend, fiance, or wife was pregnant, and he knew for sure he wasn't the daddy. Like so many other guys before him and since, Joseph found himself devastated with a very tough decision to make. Joseph, at this point, would have really had two basic options. One, go public with it or keep it private. If he went public with it, well, then Mary could actually be in a mortal situation because uh, a person up in Galilee who was betrothed really was considered virtually legally married, although they could not uh, indulge in the normal uh, situation between husband and wife. Uh, but Mary then could have been regarded as an adulteress and possibly even stoned to death depending on the conservatism of the area in Galilee where she was living at the time. Matthew tells us what he was going to do. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Quite a guy. How would you have dealt with that? Joseph did the right thing. Uh, he really loved Mary despite her apparent betrayal, as it were, and uh, resolved to divorce her quietly, and that was legal also. 
But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. I don't know about you, but for me, waking up after that would probably make me wonder what I'd eaten before I went to bed, but not Joseph. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. As you can see, Joseph was a man of action. He obeyed the Lord. Like so many other situations in the Bible, God called him to wait, and wait he did. Although he took Mary to be his wife, he would have to wait to have sex with her. That way the Son of God could truly be born of the Virgin Mary. Even though both of them had had an encounter with an angel, remember that Mary had been told by the angel Gabriel that she was going to be the mother of the Son of God, I'm sure that they still tried to live as normal a life as possible under the situation. And imagine this, they knew that they were going to have a boy, even without ultrasound. Can you imagine Joseph at his workbench, trying to wrap his head around all of this? And Mary comes running in and she says, Joseph, put your hand here, you can feel him kicking. It's a big investment to live with a pregnant woman but when the child is God's own son? Luke tells us about it. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. Augustus was pretty proud of his censuses, especially of the one he sent for Quirinius to do. It was done for the purpose of determining the potential tax revenues and other resources from this new area of Judea. The reason, of course, for taking the census was, uh, first of all, to see what kind of manpower resources you have throughout the empire, where you recruit your legions and that kind of thing, although that would not have applied to the Jews, but also the basis for future taxation. You had to know what your population base was and therefore adjust the tax rates accordingly. If you really figure out the causation here in the Christmas account, you have God using a Caesar 1,500 miles away to inaugurate the chain of events which will lead Joseph to bring Mary down to Bethlehem so the Messiah can be born there. And of course, some critics say, come on, this is a Rube Goldberg apparatus, it couldn't have happened. And you hear all kinds of complaints that the Romans never took censuses at this point, but they're all wrong. One may well wonder what Mary would look like to the neighbors when she was, shall we say, five, six, seven months pregnant. Uh, clearly, it was easier to hide a baby in those days because they had flowing garments. And for this reason, I think Mary could well have disguised her, her pregnancy. But this is one reason, by the way, that Mary chose to go with Joseph to Bethlehem to register. According to Roman law, she would not have had to make the, make the trip but she went along, really, to get away, I think, from the nosy neighbors in Nazareth. And the other reason is, of course, biblical. She knew her Old Testament as well, her Hebrew Bible, in which the Messiah, according to the prophet Micah, was to be born in Bethlehem. And so when Caesar's census comes along and says, Joseph's got to go to Bethlehem to register the family for the census, Mary says, obviously, I'll be coming along. We don't know if Joseph left town with a smile on his face, or maybe just to get away from the rumors and whispers, but off he went. Luke puts it this way. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. Have you ever traveled with a pregnant wife? I have. How many times do you think that they had to stop along the way? Even if she rode on a donkey, as tradition suggests, it would have been slow going with frequent pit stops. Can't you just picture Joseph saying, you need to stop again? I doubt if there were rest areas or truck stops, 
But imagine Joseph standing there watching all the traffic go by. Do you think he ever said, Mary, please, everybody's passing us? All right, but don't blame me if we get to Bethlehem and there aren't any rooms left. Well, step by step and stop by stop, they finally finished the 80 mile trip and arrived in Bethlehem. Next time we will see the surprises that awaited Joseph and Mary in the ancient city of David.